Cash means a lot in New Vegas. You need it to supply everything. Your stockpile of ammo and stims, maybe buy the occasional weapon or mod, gear for your companions, the list goes on. If you don't know how to effectively build up your cap count, the game is definitely a lot harder than if you did. For this video, I'm going to show you the in-depth ropes of how to make more money than is probably necessary. For starters, let's talk about the most important aspect of cap acquisition in Fallout New Vegas, and that is the weight to money ratio. This is everything. Maximizing your weight to money ratio is key to understanding how to accumulate a shit ton of caps. Let's use an example. A minigun by default weighs 25 pounds with a base value of 5,500 caps, meaning it has a weight to value ratio of 220. Every pound is 220 caps. Now, let's look at another weapon. Hailing from Lonesome Road, the h, &H Tools nail gun weighs 4 pounds with a base value of 5,000. It's worth less than the minigun, but has a weight to value ratio of 1,250, five times the amount of the minigun, meaning for every minigun in your inventory, you could have six nail guns totaling to 30,000 caps instead of the minigun's 5,500. This aspect applies to every gun, aid item, miscellaneous item, and armor piece in the game. And when you start prioritizing items with high weight to caps ratios, you're going to find yourself having a lot more inventory to sell to the Vendatron at the gun runners. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about how we're going to make money progressively throughout your playthrough. We're going to begin with talking about the base game and its best farming spots, one-off cap gains, and the best vendors with trading money on them. Following that, I'm going to go over the DLC and how to properly utilize it. But we're not going to talk about the DLC in chronological order, we're going to talk about it in my order, which I believe to be the best way to tackle all the additional content in the game. Starting in Good Springs, the Fallout 3 days of picking up cartons of cigarettes like a bum are long behind us. 50 caps just doesn't cut it in New Vegas' economy with inflation and, you know, all that. We need to be making more than that. In a new playthrough, usually the very first thing I think you should do every run is hightail it to the New Vegas casinos. I usually do this by taking the speedrunner's path, cutting through Sloan and Black Mountain, but whichever way works for you is best. Get access to the special inventory I'm making Ralphs, nab the naughty nightwear, and clean house and freeside in the strip. Hopefully you do the gambling with at least 8 luck, otherwise you're going to be in the strip mindlessly spamming W for quite some time. When it's all said and done, you should yield 39,000 caps altogether from Gamora, the Atomic Wrangler, the Tops, and the Ultralux. A nice cushion to start your playthrough and to utilize that money however you want. I highly recommend using them on implants. Additionally, before getting the larger part of your run started, you're probably going to want to go around and collect the snow globes throughout the Mojave for an extra 14k. Finding them in Good Springs, the Hoover Dam, Mormon Fort, Mount Charleston, Nellis, the Lucky 38, and Vault 21. I tend to visit Mr. House sometime before level 10, so before I hit level 15, I've already cycled through 60,000 caps or so. Now you got the big bonuses out of the way, and now it's time to start talking farming and items you're looking out for. Farming in Fallout New Vegas heavily depends on respawn timers, most of which take around 3 days give or take, and although I can't quantify it, it feels as if some NPCs respawn quicker than normal, specifically in the Divide and Lonesome Road or the Hoover Dam. There's a few key places that you can get insanely early access to that are amazing farm spots that you can start doing immediately if you have the sneak and the weapons for it. As previously mentioned, the Hoover Dam is one of these places. The NCR troopers in the visitor center of the Hoover Dam carry 12.7 pistols, combat knives, and sniper rifles, and the heavy troopers carry light machine guns, heavy incinerators, miniguns, hunting shotguns, super sledges, and of course have their armor on them. The highlights of these loot pools are the 12.7 pistols, the combat knives, and the hunting shotguns. 12.7 pistols have a weight of 3.5 and a base value of 4k, meaning that their weight to caps is roughly 1,143. Pretty fucking good. Don't sleep on combat knives because they are extremely light at a pound and have a base value of 500. Combat knives are extremely common throughout the Mojave, so always keep an eye out for them to grab and add to your list of items to sell. Finally, the hunting shotgun is a great sell option too if the heavy troops have one in their inventory. They weigh 7.5 pounds, have a base value of 3,800, and a weight to caps value of 507. Visit the Hoover Dam often to pick up some nice sell items. The interior of the Hoover Dam Visitor Center is pretty dark in the game, meaning you actually don't need that much sneak to get away with the stealth kills if you do end up doing stealth killing. On top of that, the NCR troopers are pushovers and can basically be killed whenever, given that they start the game with a measly 50 HP and scale up to 300 at level 50. The heavies are a different story. You probably won't have the killing power to one-shot them until you get a nice unarmed or melee weapon later in the game, seeing that they're heavily armored and have 290, 360, or 465 health depending on your level. Before we move on to the next area, I'm going to do a quick explanation of how the barter skill works so you understand sell value. The base value of a weapon is actually not where you're going to be selling it at. Your barter applies a modifier to that base value that affects how much vendors will buy it from you for. 
With a barter of zero, shops will buy items from you at 45% of their base value. This number increases up to a maximum of 90% with a barter of 100. This means that every point in barter is worth roughly 0.45% of sell value, meaning that every three points or so is a whole percent. Fun fact, and this number also works for buy value, but it's just the inverse. You buy items from vendors marked up 55% of their base value with a barter of zero, and buy them from vendors 10% higher with a max barter of 100. Long story short, you're getting fucking scammed. So yeah, that's what you need barter for. All right, back to making money. Hey, you wanna kill some farmers? It's okay, they're boomer farmers. No one will bat an eye. Also, we're gonna kill all the other unnamed boomers as well. Sorry. Nellis AFB is a wonderful source of cash, specifically from the unnamed boomers that carry around explosive weapons. Fun fact, Nellis AFB has the only repeatable source of non-purchased mini nukes. A random boomer in the crop field of Nellis respawns every single time with a fat man and mini nukes. The fat man doesn't have a good weight to caps ratio at all of 200, but the base value is 6,000. Weight to caps is only really crucial to pay attention to if you're strapped for carry weight. So if you have a follower to drop the fat man off to, definitely do it. Boomers and Nellis also carry around some other nice high base value weapons. Grenade launchers can be found on Boomers with a base value of 4200. Boomer Guard carry around missile launchers with a base value of 3900. And often carry around grenades with a base value of 150. But since they weigh half a pound, their weight to caps ratio is 300, which is pretty good. Additionally, the cabinets and crates around Nellis tend to have pretty good loot. The cabinets in the barracks often have combat armor, which has a base value of 6500. The metal boxes in the armory also have tons of combat armor as well. You're probably going to be making some trips to and from Nellis quite often. The weight of the combat armor tends to stack up pretty quickly. There are other places in the Mojave that I'm sure have good farm spots, but the last sort of wildcard choice I want to highlight is the Crimson Caravan Company. And that's because the guards there carry lever action shotguns. The lever action shotgun weighs three pounds with a base value of 2000, meaning the weight to caps is 667 roughly. The guards spawn in often and in plentiful amounts, often yielding several lever action shotguns. It makes their Crimson Caravan Company a pretty worthwhile visit. Before rounding out the base game, some other nice places of note are Camp Golf with NCR Veteran Rangers in late game for their armor and weapons, and Black Mountain with super mutants carrying around things like super sledges, miniguns, and heavy incinerators. I'm also going to go ahead and do an honorable mention of Great Cons and Red Rock Canyon, given that they can have items like trail carbines, hunting revolvers, hunting shotguns, lever action shotguns, and riot shotguns if you're a high enough level. It's just kind of a pain in the ass to run all around the valley and like track them down. Like it's, it's more effort than I'm willing to put in. Now we got all these items, but we need buyers. Who are we selling to? A number of people in the wasteland carry around a good amount of bartering caps, but only eight carry around 5,000 or more at the appropriate level. Lacey carries around 7,000 at the Mojave Outpost. The Vendatron at Gunrunners, Taurus in Hidden Valley, Old Lady Gibson at her scrapyard, Contreras at Camp McCarran if you don't turn them in. The Arms Merchant and Alexander at the 188 Trading Post all have 8,000 caps to trade with. The potential highest in the base game is Blake at the Crimson Caravan Company, who can carry up to 12,000 caps. Although in my experience, he usually doesn't have that much, but it's probably worth stopping by to see if he does. All right, let's get out of the Mojave and head to distant foreign lands, starting with Divide and Lonesome Road. It may seem backwards, starting with the DLC you're supposed to do last, but trust me, this is where you're going to want to go first in your playthroughs. Long story short, you get a special point, amazing armor, an insanely good weapon and old glory, skill books, and most importantly for this video, great money farms. If you do Lonesome Road first and nuke either the NCR, Legion, or both, you can clear your infamy from either faction as long as you finish Lonesome Road before taking some key quest steps. For the NCR, this is talking to Ambassador Crocker as part of the quest Things That Go Boom. The Infamy Cleanse will be the very first time you speak to Crocker after you're informed about him wanting to meet you. For the Legion, this is for finishing Ring-a-Ding-Ding -ding and exiting the Tops Casino after killing Benny, or doing whatever you want with him, usually I'd just kill him, and receiving the Mark of Kaisar. The latter is much more difficult to path around, so I usually just worry about the former. Mind you, that it isn't necessary for you to do Lonesome Road first for this, but there is no way to remove your infamy from either of these factions besides these two instances, so I like to get Lonesome Road done first so I can get the Dry Wells and Long 15 loot without being hated by the NCR for the entire playthrough. Also, for the morally corrupt viewers, a nice little abusable bug to make the entirety of Dead Money a joke, which we'll get to later. Just beating Lonesome Road in and of itself yields cash, let alone beginning farming it. 
Questing through and finding rockets, MREs, nail guns, and Bowie knives are all top tier for cat farming. The best part is that you can go between Lonesome Road and the Mojave freely. Even if you're outside of Ulysses Temple, like about to finish the DLC, you can still travel back through the entrance to the divide and make runs to your base or to vendors when your carry weight gets high enough. Throughout the Lonesome Road, you're going to want to be on high alert for Bowie knives who have a 1000 weight to caps ratio and nail guns with their previously aforementioned 1250 weight to caps ratio. Amongst other things, the marked men are going to be a significant source of income, often carrying around valuable gear like brush guns, tri-beam laser rifles, thermic lances, 12.7mm SMGs, and riot shotguns all bearing great value. Additionally, do not sleep on the marked men's armor because they all have pretty good worth. Marked scout, trooper, patrol, and tribal armor all have a base value between 2,000 and 3,000 caps, and although they do have a considerable weight, if you have open inventory space, they're good to fill out your remaining carry load. It's also good to be on the lookout for Riot gear given that it basically has a value of 8,000 caps. Okay, so you beat Lonesome Road and now it's time to farm. The marked men spawn pretty frequently in Lonesome Road. I've noticed that basically every time I travel between the Mojave and the Divide, they spawn back in. Maybe you have to wait 24 hours, but more often than not, that hasn't been the case for me. There's a number of good spots to kill the marked men when their spawn cycle finishes, but my favorite are the marked men base, the marked men camp, the Hopeville Missile Base Headquarters, the area around the 3rd Street Municipal Building and the Sunstone Tower Roof, and Ulysses Temple. If you hit all these places, you're probably going to run into around a dozen marked men and have access to all of their expensive loot. It is a bit of a dangerous farm, but with safe weapons like the sniper rifle, or Christine's COS sniper rifle that I mentioned in my last video that I'm now going to shamelessly plug, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. We're going to look at Old World Blues for the next DLC. You can honestly do OWB or Dead Money following Lonesome Road, but I prefer Old World Blues. You get easy access to a skill book for every skill, broken perks in the body part perks, especially Reinforced Spine, which gives you two whole strength, and access to all of the implants in the auto dock. There isn't a crazy amount of money to be made from Old World Blues, but the Lobotomites can carry around some pretty high cost weapons. Starting at level 10 to 20, they can have Proton Axes and Saturnite Fists. Starting at 20 to 30, they can have 10mm pistols, which actually have a good weight to caps of 250. 30 to 40, they start bringing out the big guns and carry around 44 magnums, hunting rifles, hunting shotguns, 10mm SMGs and super sledges. And 40 to 50, bring out the bigger guns and hunting revolvers and brush guns, which possess a weight to caps of 875 and 980 respectively. Brush guns notably have a base value of 4900. While you're in Old World Blues, the Proton Axe is probably going to be what you sell most commonly. The reason being that you can actually repair a Proton Axe with a single Proton Throwing Axe, an item which always comes in 100% condition when you pick it up, meaning getting a fully repaired Proton Axe to sell is quite easy, and is especially nice as a barter tool with their 3500 base value. There isn't too much else to Old World Blues, unfortunately, but the Lobotomites are a pretty nice source of caps if they spawn in with the bright weapons, and they spawn in all the fucking time, especially after the completion of the DLC. Just walking around, you'll run into groups of them so commonly, it's, it's not even funny. I don't even have a dedicated location. Literally, just walk around. Trust me, just roam. You will run into them, or they will run into you. Next stop on our world tour is Dead Money. The reason we do this third is for the skill books and the money, as well as getting access to the Elijah's Ramblings perk. There really isn't farming to be done in Dead Money at all, actually, since you can't go back into the Sierra Madre. So let's just talk about making cash while we're there. Everyone and their mother already knows about the gold bars in Dead Money, but for the uninitiated, there's a plethora of ways to get them out. The easiest being dropping them off at the barrier or dropping them off in Elijah's corpse and camera spinning to pick them up on the way out or sneaking past him by hiding around the pylon near the middle of the room. The gold bars don't actually have that good of a weight to caps ratio at 301, which has already been beaten by a number of items that I've listed so far in the video, but their raw value sort of speaks for themselves. I mean, I never take them because I can't be fucked to all the transport, but some of you greedy motherfuckers out there clearly didn't learn the DLC's lesson of letting go. Let me know if anyone else is literally just too lazy to get all the gold bars out and dropped off or if I'm like, if that's like my one weakness as a Fallout New Vegas player. Throughout Dead Money, you're going to want to try and maximize the amount of Sierra Madre chips you're getting across the DLC. You can essentially view the Sierra Madre chip as 10 caps, given that you turn them into the cashier in the casino for pre-war money. One chip is one pre-war money, and one pre-war money is 10 caps. Likewise, turning in items to the Sierra Madre vending machines yield chips in return. The most valuable being packs of cigarettes and cartons of cigarettes at 5 and 20 chips each, meaning that each pack and carton is worth 50 and 200 caps respectively. 
While you're in Dead Money, make sure to do everything in your power to generate as many of these chips as possible, especially gambling in the Sierra Madre Casino towards the end of the DLC. If done successfully, you'll walk away with around 11,000 chips, which is 110,000 caps. The limit to gambling in the casino is 10,000 chips before you get banned, and one of the rewards for hitting a positive threshold is a complimentary voucher which you redeem in the Sierra Madre vending machine for a cool 1,000 chips. Being extremely efficient and vigilant of chips, I usually find myself walking out of dead money with around 17,000 or so pre-war money. Make sure to turn in all your chips before you exit the DLC entirely because you cannot go back to dead money. Even after you kill Elijah and leave the Sierra Madre vault, you can still go back to not only the casino, but the entirety of dead money if there's anything you missed and need to clean up. Additionally, before you start bartering with pre-war money, make sure to maximize your barter skills so you get the most out of each pre-war money. The value isn't always nine or 10 for selling it. Like any other item in the game, it depends on your barter skills, so don't pull the trigger too fast on trying to cash in on your hard work. Oh right, about that thing I mentioned earlier, that uh, morally questionable aspect of the game that one can take advantage of in dead money. Well, you didn't hear it from me, but you can make dead money into kind of a joke and ridiculously easy. If you do Lonesome Road before dead money and kill the side boss Deathclaw in Lonesome Road named Rar, who is located near the Boxwood Hotel roof, you can acquire his special miscellaneous item, Rar's Talon. What's so special about Rar's Talon? It can be used to craft the unique weapon Fist of Rar, which is a very strong unarmed weapon capable of clearing a lot of enemies with relative ease. But that's not what's super special about Rar's Talon. Rar's Talon is a quest item, meaning that it can't be removed from your inventory. Immediately, you should see where this is going. Since Dead Money takes away all items upon entering the DLC besides quest items, you can keep Rar's Talon, and the only thing you need to craft the Fist of Rar is 75 unarmed. There's a handy workbench in the starting villa in Dead Money, located to the northwest of the entrance to the Sanita del Sol, that you can use to craft this weapon. Once crafted, it completely trivializes what is supposed to be a gritty, difficult survival expansion into what is basically just a routine process that needs to be completed. But that should cover Dead Money in its entirety for this section, and oh shit. It's the pain in the ass alert. All right, finishing the DLC section with Honest Hearts. Why is Honest Hearts annoying? Well, we go back to the time old struggle of not being able to depot your loot that you acquire. An issue that was present in the Fallout 3 DLCs of The Pit, Mothership Zeta, and Point Lookout has fully resurfaced in Honest Hearts. The reason I say fully resurfaced is that the other DLCs in New Vegas don't possess this problem entirely. Old World Blues has a very handy base that is centralized with good storage options for organization. Lonesome Road, you can literally freely travel between the Divide and the Mojave. And Dead Money, while being the closest to exercising this problem in its entirety, A, takes away all of your loot so you have zero weight basically to start the DLC, and B, there isn't too much that you want to take with you outside of the DLC besides gold bars and uniques. Honest Hearts is a different story. You can't leave the DLC until you're finished, and the White Legs carry around extremely valuable items that you'd want to hold on to and sell. You can remedy this problem by finding a container to store your loot, but it's just so annoying to go to the container, leave, go to the Mojave and repeat the process, especially since there really isn't a dedicated base of operations in Honest Hearts. Regardless, I'm still going to talk about what items can be obtained, and it's really just the yields of the White Legs we're going to be looking at, the faction that's the main enemy of Honest Hearts. There's four different types of White Leg classes. The Pain Makers, the Light Bringers, the Bone Breakers, and the Storm Drummers. Depending on your level, their inventory changes, but in general, they have pretty expensive weapons on them that they carry around. The Pain Maker's only valuable weapon that they carry around is the Shish Kebab, which is pretty fucking value. It has a base value of 2,500, but weighs three, so it has a great weight to caps of 833. If you see one of the Pain Makers carrying around the Shish Kebab, make sure to go grab it. Lightbringers carry around explosives, often coming equipped with fire bombs, but can also have frags, plasma grenades, and dynamite. Additionally, if you're a high enough level, the Lightbringers will carry around 12.7 SMGs, which have a base value of 5,100, with a weight to caps ratio of 1,020 a huge number on account of their light 5 pound weight. Frags and plasma grenades are also no joke for selling with a base value of 150 and 300 respectively. Bone breakers really aren't noteworthy at all given that they carry around brass knuckles, spike knuckles, bladed gauntlets, and mantis gauntlets, all of which are extremely cheap and literally not even worth mentioning in terms of value. If you see one of these spawn in, consider yourself unlucky because they have nothing on them worth the time of day besides the weapon binding rituals and that's not for the selling value, it's just for kill power. Finally, Storm Drummers are the ones that are typically going to have your goodies. They spawn in with an array of weapons depending on your level, but the highlights are numerous. Hunting shotguns, 9mm SMGs, anti-material rifles, 45 auto SMGs, riot shotguns, brush guns, and hunting rifles are all inside of the Storm Drummers loot pool leading to some good pickups on kills. It may be apparent already that coming to Zion later is beneficial for money making purposes. There really isn't a reason to come to Honest Hearts outside of Yagwai meat and a light shining in darkness. There's no good armor, except Josh Graham's, which is just worse than Ulysses Duster. V 
The only really amazing weapon is a light shining in darkness. The survivalist rifle, as badass as it is, I find to be weaker than other options, and there's no skill books to pick up that are guaranteed drops. The four workbench crates located in Honest Hearts have a chance of having a skill book in them, but it's really low and requires lengthy farming to get access to them. Even then, the chance is so abhorrent, it's just such a time waster. More often than not, you're probably going to be walking away with no skill books from this DLC. Here's a list of the chances for skill book drops from the workbench crates, and you'll realize, yeah, it's not all that. I personally hate F5, F9 hell when pickpocketing, and this is like 10 times worse than that, because you have to do it outside of the area with the crates and make the whole walk back. So yeah, count me out. Depending on how you complete Honest Hearts, you may remove the White Legs from the game entirely. If you complete Crush the White Legs instead of Flight from Zion, the White Legs are completely removed from the game. Like gone, gone. Like you can't even spawn them in using commands gone. The entire faction just got like delete key. That means you can't go back and farm them after finishing Honest Hearts, but honestly, the farm is like so, it's so miserable that it's not even worth it. Traveling up to the Northern Passage, walking through the long ass tunnel, then fast traveling around, playing Where's Waldo, trying to find the targets, it's just so not worth. It's just not worth. Farming for caps, I typically do a four point farm around the Mojave and the Divide. In no particular order, I hit Nellis AFB to farm the boomers for explosives, the Hoover Dam Visitor Center for combat knives, 12.7 pistols, sniper rifles, and heavy troop equipment, I hit the Lonesome Road for the Marked Bandit carrying around their armor and their high-level weapons, and hit the Crimson Caravan Company for their lever action shotguns. If you want extra money, you can run around Old World Blues to farm Lobotomites, Camp Golf Rangers, Great Cons and Red Rock, or Black Mountain Super Mutants for their heavy weapons. As a final note, an extra vendor that you can hit up is the Sink in Old World Blues, but in my experience, it's been extremely finicky. The Wiki claims that he can have up to 12,000 caps, but for me, he just never has that much money. Maybe in your experience, it'll be different though. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and visit Quartermaster Barton for some ammo. Before the video is over, I want to let you know I'm streaming on Twitch at player underscore loon underscore. I'm playing Tale of Two Wastelands, which combines both New Vegas and Fallout 3 into one game for a unique experience. So come learn how to path with me as I figure out in real time uh, what the best way is to optimize both the Capital and Mojave Wasteland. Also, if you have any input on the content in this video, like telling me that I am a super genius or gifted Fallout player, feel free to let me know. Or if I'm dumb as fuck, that's, that's cool too. But that's going to be it for me. See you next time.